Good morning. Good to see you. I hope you're doing well. It's good to be out of the house and out of um, quarantine after uh, 10 days, 11 days actually. It got a little long. Uh, of course, my wife is still recovering, but I'm glad to say my son and I were tested negative, uh, which is just odd, isn't it, that we could be so close to the source and yet still be uh, unaffected by this virus. And, and, and my wife herself, who lately has barely gone out, uh, went out to the supermarket and uh, was able to there find the virus, or it found her in that brief visit to the supermarket. And that's the way it is. Well, thanks be to God, we are joined together this morning, and my hope is that we will be able to truly worship our Lord together. I was online last week with you folks, and I must say, I'd much rather be here in this room with you worshiping. I look forward to those of you who are online this morning to the day in which you can be here with us as well. It's a completely different worship experience, uh, and that is to say, um, being here, we could actually engage more so than the passive casual watching online. Nonetheless, I'm glad we can minister to you um, during this COVID pandemic era. We can minister, you can watch us, and hopefully even worship uh, to some degree as you join with us this morning. Let's stand together and let's sing, There is a Fountain. The words are on the screen for you. Let's worship the Lord. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there have i though vile as he washed all my sins away washed all my sins away washed all my sins away and there have i though vile as he washed all my sins away and there his precious blood lose its power till all the ransom church of God are saved to sin no more are saved to sin no more are saved to sin no more saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die 
be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing to say good morning everybody as pastor said if you could open up to first john chapter 5 first john chapter 5 we'll be reading verses 10 through 17 this morning let's begin verse 10 whoever believes in the son of god has the testimony in himself Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this is life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he, asks, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not, do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say to one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Thanks be to God for his word. It is good to be here with you. I really mean that. After being um, in isolation uh, for uh, more than 10 days, um, along with my son and my wife, it is good to be able to be out and to be healthy and to be uh, able to freely be around and about uh, and just to be able to come to God's house and worship. It's, uh, it's amazing what a difference it is um, being here with God's people and actually talking to people, interacting with people versus passively watching on TV. Um, or on your computer. It's not that it's impossible to worship online, but I must say it is difficult. Uh, it's not hard to pay attention online, but it is difficult to worship. I learned that last week as I joined you folks um, in, while in quarantine. It was good to see you from a distance, but boy, did I want to be here instead. Not because I'm the pastor, but because I'm a child of God. It's just good to be in God's house on awards day. It really is. And so it's good to be here with you. Open in your scriptures, will you, to the epistle of 1 John, to that very text that Joe was reading to us just a few moments ago. 1 John. I know we've been studying the book of Exodus, but I decided to go to 1 John on this Lord's Day morning, and we'll return back to the book of Exodus next week. And Joe read to us from chapter 5, and we're going to be taking a look at two particular verses in that chapter, verses 14 and 15, maybe you've noticed as you've read through 1 John 5 that this very last portion of that epistle speaks about things we can know with great certainty. In fact, seven times over, John writes, this we know or we know, seven times over. 
right? So, so he's very specific about being certain about certain things. And I find that interesting because certainty is not something that's very familiar to us these days. We live in very uncertain days. Today, if you see a, a, a backpack in a corner at the train station, you wonder, what could that be? Uncertainty. Uh, the stock market seems to be doing well, but we are all watching with uh, quite a bit of vigilance because it is uncertain as to what's going to happen next. And if you listen to rumors, you'll be frightened. Uh, we live in a day where the, the news, the national news, makes us afraid and uncertain. Uh, we, we live in a time in which the direction of our nation is questionable, and we wonder what will happen next. And of course, of late, there's all sorts of rumors of what's going to happen in the month of March. And listen, my friends, by worrying about it is not going to change a single historical episode. What you need to do is pray about it and trust in the Lord. What is true, what is not, I'm certainly not the person to, to tell you. I wouldn't know. But I do know my God, and I do know our Lord, and I know he is watching over his own. In a world with so much uncertainty, it's very comforting to know that what we need to know most, we can know with all certainty. What we do need to know most, we can know, and we can know it with all certainty. In a world with so much uncertainty, this we can know according to 1 John 5, that God hears our prayers and that God answers our prayers. And this is extremely important for a couple of different reasons, but one that comes to mind is because we often wonder whether or not God is hearing our prayers. We wonder whether or not God is answering our prayers. Well, according to 1 John chapter 5, read with me, beginning at verse 13, and we'll work our way down to verse 15. We read the following. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Do you see that? And this is the confidence that we have toward him, toward God, that if we ask anything according to God's will, God hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. We know our prayers are heard and our prayers are answered. Uh, that should be very encouraging and very comforting to you. Uh, we can petition God. Uh, and we can do so with a great deal of confidence. Uh, here again, verse 14 says, This is the confidence that we have. It's not wishful thinking, it's not crossing your fingers, but you approach God with boldness knowing that you can know that he does hear you and that he does answer you. Now granted, his answer may not always be what you want, but he does hear you and he does answer you. I'm reminded of Psalm 65 too, which reads this way, O you who hear prayer, referring to God, O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. That is to say, every single human being will one day stand before the presence of God, whether willingly or not. So we can go to God at the end of life, willingly or not, or we can go to God now in prayer. Proverbs 15, 29 reads, God hears the prayers of the righteous, and of course, James 5, 16 reads, The prayer of the righteous person has great power. Why? Because God answers prayer. We can now talk to God. We read in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba. Abba is the Aramaic word for daddy. It means father, yes, but it's a more intimate 
relational term. Daddy. We could cry out, Daddy, to our God. So that, my friends, the natural response of anyone who recognizes God as their Heavenly Father is this, prayer. That's the natural response. If you recognize God as your Father, you pray. Have you ever seen a, a, child, a child's eyes when, when, when she sees her mother or her father, especially her mother, right? All of a sudden, her eyes just open up and she wants to go exactly directly to the mom directly to the parent. She says, look, I'm tolerating you, but really what I want is that person. And, and that's the reality of the Christian who knows God as Father. I want to go to you. My eyes open up, and I want to be with you. I want to speak to you. We pray because we have a Father to pray to, is what it comes down to. In fact, assurance of salvation is the displayed in prayer. Why would I pray? Because I know I'm in Christ. I know that God is my Father. And people who pray in faith are saying, I know that God exists. If you're praying in faith, you're saying, I, I, I am certain that I belong to him, and therefore I know that he hears me. Do you realize that God has not committed himself to answering the prayers of unbelievers but he has covenanted with you, with his own, with his children, to hear and answer your prayers. He has not committed himself to anyone outside of him. Now, he can do as he pleases. He can hear and listen to whoever he wants. But with us, his covenanted people, his church, he has committed himself so that he will hear, he will answer. It's good news. Because God is good, when he hears me, I know he will answer my prayers. And it's not a matter of how eloquent or how beautiful your prayer is. And I know some people who can pray beautifully. I tend to go into a rut and I find myself saying the same things over and over again. If, if I allow it. Some people pray eloquently and beautifully, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking here about Praying in faith. Praying in faith does not mean I'm wishing and I'm really believing, really believing that he's going to answer me and that he's going to give me what I ask. That's not what prayer and faith is. Prayer and faith is that I believe that he exists. I believe that he hears me. I believe that he is good and there I can trust his answer. Praying in faith. So that we can very freely come before God in prayer and express ourselves to him. And it can be done in a big group. It can be done in a family. It can be done, hopefully, daily by yourself. Hopefully more than once. Certainly more than just when you are about to eat your meal. But that you spend time with God as your father, as your Abba in prayer. So that verse 14 reads, we can ask anything of our God and he will hear us. But you see the condition there, right? Verse 14, look, it says, if we pray, what? According to his will. That changes things a little, doesn't it? If we pray according to his will. We see likewise when Jesus Christ was teaching the disciples how to pray, what did he say? He says, thy will be done, right? The will of God the Father be done when we pray. John chapter 14, verse 12, echoes the same idea. It says, whatever you ask in my name, this is Christ speaking, and he says, whatever you ask in my name, in other words, in my authority, according to my will, according to my purposes, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That the Father would be glorified in the Son. Prayer is not a, um, a sanctioned way of, of forcing God to answer us and give us what we want. Prayer is not a rubbing the genie's lamp and forcing God to give us our three wishes. That's not what prayer is. But it is a way of placing ourselves under the will of God. 
Why do we pray? Because in praying, we are not only petitioning God, but we are placing ourselves under the will of God. And we're saying, your will be done. To pray according to the will of God, now think about it. To pray according to the will of God means that if God is good, and if God is wise, and if you believe that God is powerful and just, if you believe that God is loving, and if you believe that God desires to nurture not only your soul, but your body, the entire being, if you really believe that that is who God is, then why in the world would you want to over, uh, overcome or supersede his will? If God is good, why would you not want his will for you? If God is concerned for you more than you are for yourself, why would you not want his will for your life? In fact, it would be masochistic for God's children to want something less than God's will. Pray biblically. And if you pray biblically, you will know that what you have requested of your Heavenly Father will be granted to you. In fact, if you read on there, beginning of verses 16 and 17, it gets more complicated, those verses. But you can see there that if you read on, you could also not only pray for yourself, but you can have confidence in interceding for other people as well. If indeed you're praying according to the will of God. But how do we know the will of God? I know that's what you're wondering, right? That's great. I'm more than willing to pray the will of God. But what is the will of God? How do I know what I'm praying for is the will of God? Well, last week, as I was getting ready to join you here on, on our streaming, I was um, watching a couple TV preachers. And one fellow opened up this passage, 1 John 5. It was a huge audience church was filled with people and he opened up to first john 5 and he said this is the will of god and he took uh, the the term will as meaning last will and testament like a document he said this is the will of god and the will of god says that i should not be lacking in anything and so and this is what he said and people loved it i prayed that god would give me a rolls royce this was the will of god for me and he did. And then, without me even asking, God is good, and he replaced the Rolls Royce with a Bentley I never asked for. And so I gave my Rolls Royce to my son-in-law. And this is not what the text is saying. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of people really loved it because how many people don't want a Bentley? Bentley's nicer than a Rolls Royce. And all he had to do was ask. He got it, and then beyond, because this was the will of God. The word here for will is the Greek word that means God's preferred will. It's not talking about last will and testament. It's talking about God's preferred will, God's preferred desire for your life. So what we're reading here is that we are to pray according to God's preferred desire for your life. How do we do that? Well, I think it will help us if we understand that there are three types of wills in God. That God has three, three ways in which we can understand the term will. Three different wills of God. The first one is this. First, we have God's sovereign decrees or God's sovereign will. A decree is what God has declared will be. And when did he do this? He did this before creation. God has his eternal decrees by which he said, this will be, this will not be. This is God's sovereign will. Now, the truth is, my friends, is that God orders all that has or ever will occur in this world. God is responsible for everything. Whether he actually caused it or allowed it, God is ultimately responsible for everything that occurs in this world because he's sovereign. He controls it all. And he could cause it or stop it. 
And whatever he causes or doesn't stop, he is responsible for. And in his decrees, he said, these things will be. These things will not be. And this is his sovereign will. Now, the details of his sovereign decrees, by and large, we do not know. We don't know what those things are. And neither can we change it. But the truth is, is that God will somehow work history out, human history out, so that those decrees will come to pass. It's amazing. Only God can do it. But he will, and he is doing it. What he said will be, will be. That's a good thing. You know why? Because God is good. We shouldn't be afraid of his decrees. It will be in accord with his wisdom. It will be in accord with his purpose. This is the will of God. Whether you're talking about world history or talking about a nation's history, whether you're talking about an individual or a family, whether or not you're talking about the universe and even into eternity, God's decrees will eventually, in due time, according to his purpose, will come to pass. It's God's sovereign will. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29 speaks about these, these decrees of God. Deuteronomy 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. They're secrets. We don't know it. We're not privy to them. But God's in control. Uh, likewise, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. His thoughts, God's thoughts, his thoughts are not our thoughts, nor our ways his ways. As the heavens are higher than earth, so are his ways and thoughts higher than ours. Let me give you another one. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 4, beginning of verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And it came to pass, because God said, this will be. Let me give you one more. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, we read, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. He works everything, all things, according to the counsel of his will. So that what we see here in these passages and in life itself, in history, is that God uses man's actions, whether they're good actions or bad actions. God uses those actions and he intricately weaves them together, whether we're talking about a father or mother or children, um, whether you're talking about kings or rulers, whether you're talking about a lawyer or a plumber doesn't matter if you're a preacher or a cab driver, whether you're a teacher or a noble, it doesn't matter. Your decisions, your choices, God takes those and he weaves them together to form the history that he has planned in order for the outcome that he has determined to occur. Only God can do that. And he's doing it right now. He's been doing it since day one. And we cannot stop him, and neither should we want to stop him. He is good. Why would you want to stop him? The second will of God is God's moral will. God's moral will. We have God's sovereign will or sovereign, sovereign decrees, and now we have God's moral will. And God's moral will simply refers to those things that are right and wrong, right and wrong. And God has listed those things very clearly for us in the scriptures. He's ingrained them in our heart, but he's also revealed them to us in the pages of the Bible. What is morally correct and what is morally wrong? And it, it is not based on simply his good pleasure, but rather what is morally correct is based on his righteous character. God is holy. And the standard of morality comes from who he is. It comes directly from his character. Morality is a reflection of who God is. It's that simple. In fact, that's the great distinction between the God of the Bible and the God of, let's say, the, um, uh, the old Greek uh, myths or the pagan gods of the Old Testament. 
The God of the Bible versus those gods, the difference, the great difference is this. Besides one exists and the other doesn't. The great difference is this. The God of the Bible, the true God, is a moral God. He's a moral God. He's an upright God. He's holy. Take, for example, what we see in the Ten Commandments, whether it's um, out of Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5. Take the Ten Commandments, and there you have two tables. The first table teaches us how we are to interact with God. The second table teaches us how we are to interact with each other setting for us the standard of morality. What is right and what is wrong? Well, it, it, it is communicated in its most basic form there in those Ten Commandments. How we respond to God and how we respond to each other, setting the standard for morality. Morality can only be determined, it can only be said by one who is moral himself. In other words, I cannot set up the standard for what is moral. You know why? Because I'm a sinner. I'm immoral. Morality cannot come from me. The best I can do is convey to you what is moral, but I cannot determine what is moral. And neither can you. Because we're all sinners. Born in this broken world. Immoral ourselves. Now, maybe we're not as immoral as we can possibly be, but nonetheless, we are immoral people. We are sinners. Morality is not progressive. What was moral a thousand years ago is still moral today. What was moral a hundred years ago is still moral today. So that we can't say, well, a hundred years ago, abortion was immoral, but today we have progressed and it's moral now, and so a woman has the right to decide what she's going to do with her body. Well, it's still immoral because it's based on the standard of God, not on the standard of history or the progression or di digression of man. We don't decide what morality is. It comes from that who is good, who is holy, who is upright, and that alone is God. So morality does not change. It was established for us, not by us. So if you are going to pray effectively, your prayers need to be couched in God's moral will. You cannot pray against God's moral will and expect things to go well. Expect for God to answer your prayers accordingly. You don't want that. Our prayers need to be couched in accord with what God has deemed as right versus wrong. There is a third type of will, God's permissive will. Number three, God's permissive will. So we have God's sovereign decrees, we have God's moral will, and now we have God's permissive will as well. And God's permissive will is just that. It, what, it is what God allows to happen. Certain things that God allows. Um, Often what God allows today is far different than what God originally intended to allow before sin entered into the world. That is to say that because of sin, God now allows certain things to be done or to happen because of the choices of sinful people. It doesn't mean that God sanctions it. When I say God's permissive will, I'm not saying that God says, oh, yes, that's good, I condone it, I sanction it. No. I simply mean that God allows it to come to pass. He allows you to, uh, to make that choice. He allows you to make the choice whether it be good or bad. And why would he do that? Why would God allow for us to make certain choices that we know, he knows, are not going to be good for us? Well, for one thing, he's using, he's using your choices, our choices, to fulfill his ultimate will, his sovereign will. Whatever choices we're making, good or bad, and I hope there's a lot of good, he's using those choices to fulfill his ultimate decrees. But he's also using those same choices to divulge what is in our hearts, 
whatever choice you, be, you may be making, good or bad, wise or foolish, he allows, to a certain degree, in order to divulge, especially to ourselves, what is in our very own hearts. We can know who we are, what we believe, when we examine ourselves, when nobody else is watching, when we examine what choices we make. Our choices divulge who we really are. But he's also using his permissive will as a means of teaching us that we are responsible for the choices we make. As he allows us to make certain choices, he's saying, see, you are responsible for the choices, for the choices you make. And again, it does not necessarily mean that he's going to sanction your choice, but he simply allows it to happen. Let me give you a few examples. At the very end of Genesis, chapter 50, right, the very last chapter, verse 20, maybe you recall, what did Joseph say to his brothers? He said, he said, as for you, you meant evil against me. Remember what his brothers did to him? I mean, his brothers were terrible, terrible. Now, Joseph didn't help the situation, but his brothers were terrible. Eventually, they, they sell him off into slavery. Can you imagine selling your brother? I can't. No, I can't. Selling your brother off to slavery? Can you imagine that? That's what they did. You meant it for evil. God allowed it. Permissive will. But look at what we read there. But God meant it for good. That was his moral will. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Why? To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so you see the two coming together. God's moral will and God's permissive will. Here's another one. 1 Samuel chapter 8. The people were clamoring for a king. And they said, Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations have. And this request certainly did displease God. This was not God's desire for his people. But he granted them this wish nonetheless. To their detriment. But it was his permission that allowed it. In the book of Exodus, we see God's will for the Hebrew nation to escape out of Egypt, and in a matter of weeks, they would have been in a promised land. But because he allowed them to make the choices they wanted to make, and they were bad choices, but he permitted it, their journey into the promised land was detoured for 40 years. It's a long time because of his permissive will. By permissive will, I'm saying that God simply allows us to live according to the choices that we make, whether good or bad, and then either enjoy or suffer through the consequences. Hmm? Well, then how do we pray God's will? We have his sovereign decree, we have his moral will, we have his permissive will. How then do we pray according to his will, as we see here in 1 John 5.14? If you pray according to his will, you should have confidence that he will, he will hear you and answer you. Well, in, in talking here about his will, I think it's obvious that that first category, number one, God's sovereign decree, really has nothing to do with what we're discussing here, right? It has no implications with, what, um, with the topic of prayer. We, we are not privy to God's sovereign decree, so therefore we can't, we, we can't pray in accord to those secret decrees. But I do believe that God's moral will and God's permissive will has a lot to do with how we pray. So, so let's take a look at that a little bit more. You'll notice that when we do pray, often what are we asking for? We're asking for God to restrain the actions of somebody else. And, and listen, especially to, to those of you who believe that, that God does not impose himself on people, what, what are we doing when we ask God to protect somebody. For, for example, Lord, I, I pray for her as she walks across that dark parking lot every night. Keep her safe. Why do we pray that? Because God's moral will is that robbery, rape, murder is wrong. That's God's moral law. But we're also praying, God, restrain that guy that lurks in the corners of the parking lot every night and watches her. Restrain him from doing anything he ought not to do. 
So we're asking God to impose himself on that person, restrain that person. Don't let that person do what would come naturally. We say, Lord, don't let, don't let his enemies overtake him. Why? Because we know God's moral law. God's, God's moral will is that righteousness and justice are important. And so we say, don't let his enemies overcome him. Right? When we pray, we often pray according to God's moral will. We say, Lord, don't let this marriage end in divorce. Why? Because we know the scriptures say that God hates divorce. Right? That's God's moral will. However, when we pray according to God's moral will, we cannot overlook also that his permissive will exists as well. Again, it's not that God necessarily condones it, but he does allow it in this broken world. He does. We see it again and again in experience, but often in the scriptures as well. And often when we pray, we're asking God to overrule that person's choice and, and insist on God's moral will to be upheld. And we say, God, open the eyes of that person so that that person will desire you, so that that person will desire your moral standards for life. How many times have you prayed that for somebody? Something along those lines. Open their eyes, Lord. Whenever you say, open their eyes, Lord, you're, you're saying, Lord, show them your moral standard, your moral will, that they may enjoy life and know true life. Or we're praying, uh, often we're saying, Lord, simply, I'm coming to you so that you will show me what your will is, so that I could pray accordingly, because I really do want to pray according to your will. Not only because I want to see my prayer answered, but because I believe that your will is good. So how do we pray according to the will of God? Well, I have four questions you should ask yourself. Four questions to ask yourself as we draw to an end here. Here's question number one. In regards to your prayer, is my prayer in accord with God's moral standards? What I'm asking for, is it in agreement with God's moral standards? Number two, will my choice that I'm making, what I'm asking of God, will my choice glorify, honor Christ in me? Will my cho choice bring glory to Christ in me? Number three, and very similar, Will what I ask for further the cause of Christ? What I'm asking for, will it further the cause of Christ in me and in those around me? All right. I don't see how a Rolls Royce would do that, but you tell me. And number five, and this one is probably the more difficult of the five. Am I asking this of you, Lord, purely because I want more gain for myself? Or is it because this is what is right, this is what is good, this is what is just? What I'm asking you, Lord, is it because I'm simply being selfish? Or is it because this is the good thing, this is the right thing, this is the just thing that I should be asking for? Four important questions to ask. Uh, and because this is so common to us, uh, let me use the example of divorce once again. It's become uh, um, very prevalent in our culture, and some of you have suffered through that. Uh, I know that God, God's moral standard is what? I hate divorce. But we also see recorded for us in Matthew 19, God's permissive will. Let me show you what I mean. In Malachi 2.16, God says, God hates divorce. We see it likewise in Matthew 19, verse 6. Look at what we see there. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. Right? That's God's moral will. What God has covenanted two people with together, let nobody separate. But then you see in the following two verses, Matthew 19, verses 7 and 8, we see God's permissive will. Are you with me? 
So when Jesus Christ said to them, let no man separate, the disciples turned to him and said, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, this is Christ responding, he says, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. So you see there, not God condoning, but permitting for a person to make a particular choice. Here's God's moral will. Here's God's permissive will. And he allows us to make the choices we're going to make, but with this understanding. There are consequences, good and bad, with all the choices we make when we move away from God's moral will and leap into his permissive will. Beware, beware. God is a forgiving God, absolutely, but consequences come when we leap against the moral will of God. So how should we pray, for example, for somebody who's in the situation where divorce is imminent? How should we pray? Well, we could pray this way, God's moral will. We say, Lord, restore that marriage. Lord, protect their hearts. Lord, teach them to forgive. Teach them to repent. Lord, teach them to abide by your moral standard. That's how we can pray with this understanding that God may very well allow them to make their choices and to have their choices and then live according to their choices, God's permissive will. It's not that God sanctions it, but he allows people to make those choices. So look, my friends, in considering God's moral will, God's permissive will, once again, this is how we should pray in order to discover God's will for my life. If I'm going to pray effectively, I must pray according to God's, God's will. So I ask my, myself, is it moral? Is it Christ-honoring? Is it purely selfish? Am I simply being a discontented person with a disquieted spirit that is never satisfied? How are you praying? Now, I'm not suggesting that these four questions are easy, but I'm saying they are necessary if you are going to seek God's will for your life. And of course, as I'm praying, I'll have to decide whether or not I am in agreement with God's will. I'll have to decide to decide whether or not this is actually God's will and then make my choice accordingly. Is it Christ honoring? Am I being selfish? Is this going to promote the standards of God? Am I simply being a discontented person? And there's going to be permissive latitude, no question about it. There's going to be permissive latitude as I'm looking for God's will in my life. But, but I will have to live with whatever choices I make. But I can say this, look, if you are praying in that way in which I, I mentioned, answering those four questions appropriately, if indeed it is in accord with God's moral will, if indeed it is honoring to Jesus Christ, if indeed it is not purely selfish but is actually going to promote Christ in your life and in the life of those around you, if indeed you are praying with a spirit of contentment, saying, Lord, your will be done, your will is good, then honestly, I believe that you can make pretty much any choice you want and be within the will of God you will be in the will of God, and God will reward you. To pray according to God's will means that you request those things that are moral, that you're seeking to honor Christ, once again, that you're not looking to, um, to, to just look out for yourself, and that you are a content person looking for God's blessing, yes, but looking to serve and seek him out. So that your prayer should consistently echo the words of Jesus Christ, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if that be so, you will be in the will of God as you live out in this broken, uncertain world.
Uh, as we finish this morning, we'll uh, sing praise Adonai, and uh, Lord, I give you my heart. Please rise. Who is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise Adonai All the nations of the earth All the angels and the saints sing praise Who is like him The lion and the lamb Seated on the throne Mountains bow down Every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai. From the rising of the sun till the end of every day. Praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Praise Adonai. Praise Adonai From the rising of the sun To the end of every day Praise Adonai All the nations of the earth All the angels and the saints Say praise
before you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me. And I will live. And I will live. And I will live for you. And I will live. And I will live. And I will live for you. And I will live And I will live for you Lord, I give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Have your way. been in a place in life where we thought something was God's will only to discover that it wasn't and that we made choices we ought not to make. As I read in 1 John chapter 5, right towards the end, verse 19, these are the words penned for us. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. My friends, we know that we are from God, that he has placed us here for a purpose. And the God that reveals his will to us and at times allows us to live within his permissive will is also a forgiving God. A God who corrects us, disciplines us, yes, but always forgives us. Constantly, continuously. And we praise him because wherever we have blown it in the past, he forgives and allows us to start over and over again. Let's close in prayer. To our Lord, our God, who is the King and Redeemer, to the forgiver of saints, his own church, the one Lord who has come to us that we would be his forever and ever, we give glory and honor May we know your will and live by it, O oh God, I pray. Amen.